Thanks, Pat. You want that? Now you can use that one. Okay. All right. Well, it's great to see the room full. And thank you all for coming out. It's a beautiful day. And um, I have a uh, pretty detailed presentation to make here today. But you don't have to read these slides. Um, I will provide them to you. And basically, I'm trying to explain to you why the sense of urgency that um, is compelling uh, local action. Pam's sound check wasn't half as complicated as mine. I'm going to attempt to play a tiny little snip of sound from nature. This is an Australian magpie. The Australian magpie is an expert in reproducing the sounds that it hears in its own environment. And we'll see if this one will sing for us. <laughs> the Australian magpie now plays the so sound of fire engines. <laughs> and I'll try to turn this off so she doesn't interrupt us anymore. So it's about time. What do I mean when I say it's about time? Well, every year it gets warmer. We know that. And it's the science that tells us this. My talk today is based entirely in science. And when you see the uh, version that I'm happy to distribute, it'll have the links where you can go and read the science for yourself. Because it's actually pretty um, accessible to an ordinary person. Some of it, you'll see, is a little thicker than other. Um, the World Meteorological Organization provided this wheel a few months ago, united in science. And the thing that jumped out of me here is the purple graph between 3 and 4 o'clock. The purple line says climate impacts are hitting harder and sooner than predicted a decade ago. And that's very much um, clear to us now that the effects of climate change are arriving faster than we thought they would. And they're so far turning out to be a little bit worse than I, we thought they would be. If there were one document that I'd like you to spend some time with as an informed citizen of the US, it's the Fourth National Climate Assessment. And um, the reason for that is that these are some details of what we can expect in the, in the coming uh, years. But the point is that it's decisions made today that are going to primarily affect the future that we face. Our decisions of the past are already affecting us, but the decisions that we make today are critically important. And another thing that I would point out about the National Climate Assessment is that it went through the gold standard of peer review. Not only an open public review of its early drafts, which were published and anybody uh, could comment on them, but a peer review by the National Academy of Sciences, which is a very rigorous and thorough peer review. When I read the peer review document of this report, it was 300 pages. And so this is the best that American science has to offer. And it's without political agenda. And its, um, its findings are detailed and highly persuasive. Why do we care about climate change? This chart is called the fever chart. And it, it talks about the reasons for concern. And I'm just going to point out um, uh, one aspect of this. The, the bars that are the darkest at the top are those in which the effects of climate change are most pronounced as temperature goes up. And the upper left-hand one talks about unique and threatened systems. And these are our ecosystems which are uh, most at risk from climate change. And as the graph at the bottom left shows, the bar at the bottom left shows, warm water corals are first and foremost among those. And 
I just point out to you that what we're talking about here are uh, parts of nature that are irreplaceable and that are fundamentally important to uh, our life on the planet. And so that it's really a matter of stewardship. If you're asking yourself what's the importance of actions that are taken today, these are the core of our stewardship of a complex and uh, irreplaceable um, uh, uh, planet. Now you probably heard and read the news headlines a couple of years ago when the IPCC brought out what's called its one and a half degree report. And of course we all know that what we're talking about is warming of one and a half degrees Celsius above the industrial age um, uh, pre-existing condition before we started burning fossil fuels. And that the Paris Agreement has long held two degrees of warming to be its objective, no more than two degrees of warming, but that it's recently, uh, we've recently moved to talking about one and a half degrees. And I just want to point out that a child born today is going to live somewhere in the margin between this one and a half degrees and two degrees. And depending on that child's circumstances, that half degree of extra warming is profoundly important. In the one and a half degree report, the IPCC, which sets the um, world scientific consensus on this subject, examined what difference would it make whether we allow the world only to warm about another one and a half degrees or whether we allow it to warm another two degrees. And the difference is, for example, in the case of coral reef are, at one and a half degrees, we have a 50-50 chance of saving half of our existing coral reefs. And at two degrees, we have essentially no chance of saving any of our existing coral reefs. And so if you happen to live in a, an economy that's based on subsistence fishing near a coral reef, then that's a profound difference to you. This small degree of warming makes a profound difference. And in order to have any confidence of coming in at one and a half degrees of warming, we need to reduce global emissions by about 45% from the level of 2010 by the year 2030, 10 years from now. And this is what gave rise in 2017 to the headlines that you've heard discussed in which people say there are 12 years left to halt climate change. And that's a reasonable interpretation if it's not taken too literally of the situation that we're in today. The timeline, as this uh, uh, document describes, gives us an opportunity to limit these further actions. And it's the general framing. What are we talking about here today is what are our actions in the next very few years? Now, when you really study these, you get dive deep into complexity. And I, there'll be a test on this graphic coming right up. <laughs> the, the key number in this graph is zero. And, he, and here's why. No matter what amount of warming you're willing to tolerate, whether it's one and a half degrees, two degrees, three degrees, four degrees, six degrees, at six degrees, much of the planet will not be inhabitable. But no matter where you want to draw the line, so to speak, to stop at that point, we all have to collectively get our emissions of greenhouse gases to zero. Because you think of the atmosphere as being like a bathtub that's filling up with, from a dripping faucet, but that has a, a, a sort of a clogged drain, so some of the water is draining out. Um, because the carbon cycle is complicated, carbon dioxide is added, and uh, its concentrations naturally dissipate over thousands of years. But the bathtub is going to spill over unless you get that drip to zero. And that's in simple terms where we are with our atmosphere. And in the bottom left there, you can see that these various pathways lead to zero, and sooner pathways have one effect and later pathways have another, but basically the cumulative emissions 
are reaching net zero here in about 2040, 2050, 2055. And so the zero number is something that's waiting for us as a fairly imminent deadline. But that graphic sustained by this kind of writing in the report, it's, it's really, if you want a definition of hell, it's being a journalist with this, with this reporter has to write a short declarative sentence in 20 minutes. Um, but what is the bumper sticker that you would draw from that language? Well, because you have to have reductions by 45% in 2030 and reach net zero around 2050, you have, as of, as of uh, 2017 when this was written, you have about 12 years and otherwise you're gonna be facing an impossible situation. The scientists are telling us now that this requires radical and immediate transformation. And it's really striking if you read science. As every morning when I wake up, I read uh, these uh, 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 agglomerations of science reports. And I really have stayed on top of climate science as a journalist for uh, full time for the past eight years, but really since the 1980s. And uh, when you see scientists start to talk about radical and immediate transformation of society, that's unusual. And when they say that you have to get to zero, that's a pretty firm number. Mm -hmm. And so you have to learn to listen and to realize that they're actually not kidding around. And the voice of scientists has been more and more alarmed in the past couple of years, I have to tell you. Yeah. Um, as you read this science, you realize that scientists are really becoming more alarmed. And the situation is actually more urgent. So that you see thousands of scientists signing on to declarations like this, that scientists have a moral obligation to uh, warn humanity to tell it like it is, and that what's at stake is the fate of humanity. And this statement was published in peer-reviewed scientific journals and, uh, and signed by 10,000, 11,000 scientists. This is where the consensus is now. And although, although there is room for some optimism here and that we people begin to talk about how about carbon removal, although it's a lot harder to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere than it is to put it in, it's a lot harder to grow a tree than it is to throw another log on the fire. Um, but carbon removal is a real thing, and it can buy you a couple of years. But in this chart, when they say that carbon removal, carbon removal has a role to play in solving the problem, that's that blue part at the bottom and the big hump at the top is not putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to begin with. So it gives you a chance of achieving this very difficult task, but it is itself a very difficult task. And it looks like we're gonna have to do both and the reason is that we've waited so long. Here's another chart that shows us that the overshoot uh, option buys you only a few years and basically where the lines cross here in the, at the elbow of this curve is the point of reaching zero emissions. And as you see, the carbon removal in the gray area at the bottom allows you to shift that line out to the right a little bit, but it really doesn't buy you very much time. Let's bring it back home. Here in our part of the world, we will warm three degrees when the rest of the planet reaches two degrees. So just bear that in mind. We live in one part of the world. Things are different in other parts of the world. And in some places, it's worse. In the Arctic, it will be much warmer. And so the Arctic ice will melt when the rest of the world warms two degrees. And in other places, it will be drier or wetter there'll be more storms or there'll be more frequent storms. So we're gonna talk a little bit of what it means for us. And here in Vermont, 
a couple of degrees of warming means the difference between what we're used to two days a year when it's the heat index that reaches above 90 degrees. That's the heat index is the opposite of the wind chill. It's what it, it's the feel like temperature. We can expect 19 days by 2050. We can expect 44 days of feels like 90 here by the end of the century. And that's going to make a profound difference in the way we operate here in Vermont. And that's why Vermonters have adopted these energy targets. But the question is, is the Vermonter going to say, you can't get there from here? <laughs> this is our performance in the black line. And off on the right, those dots are our statutory or uh, aspirational targets. And those are steep curves. And until recently, we've been heading the wrong way in arriving at those dots. And these reductions really have to be made very quickly. We're talking about millions of metric tons of emissions to be reduced by 2025 or 2028, which is really only a couple of years away. In other words, the actions that we take today are essential in meeting these targets that are intended to avoid the worst risks that we're talking about. And the longer we wait, the harder we're going to fall. Let's go on. So if we had peaked our emissions in 2016, it would have been a shallower curve than if we wait until 2025, when it's really, I'm not skiing down that black diamond slope on the right. Um, and the next three graphs show this. 10 years ago, we were looking at annual reductions of 3.3%. And then now, we're looking at annual reductions of 7.5% or so. Percent. And if we wait five years, then our annual reductions would have to be twice that steep, 15%. And so a few years makes a tremendous difference in the amount of effort that's required for us to meet these objectives. If you want to have a read a thoughtful news article about what does it really mean when we say we have 12 years to act, I recommend this one that was published in Inside Climate News. This was published a few days after I retired. And, uh, and uh, it really captures the scientific debate. You need to learn trusted news sources, and there are many of them. But um, you can't just take everything that you find as being authoritative. But inside Climate News, we have no agenda. It's a nonprofit, nonpartisan, uh, independent news organization run by journalists. And that's all these journalists that have ever done is journalism. And uh, I'm, I'm really quite proud of the work that we've done. In fact, I'm going to be bragging about it some more in a minute. <laughs> So the question is not if this is going to happen, but when. And once again, this looks a little complicated, but the bottom line is that the, uh, the bottom graph shows that we will be crossing the threshold of um, two degrees in about, well, about now. Um, and so that the continental United States is going to be hitting these thresholds a little sooner than the rest of the world, no matter which scenario of our future <laughs> use you look at. And the next graph shows the same notion in a different way. But in three to six years, the black line on the left shows New England most likely crossing the barriers that we're talking about of one and a half to two degrees of warming. And the measurement here is a, a blend of 64 different models uh, two different, on two different scenarios. And uh, it's the complicated modeling science, but it's presenting a very simple lesson. This is coming to a neighborhood near you sooner than to the rest of the world. 
So the only question has been, it's like asking, when is John McEnroe going to have a temper tantrum? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And that's why urgency is such an issue. And back to the data, we see the signal emerges from the noise. These are your scarves, these are our pins. The graph shows the what's called the mean surface temperature anomaly on a decadal scale. In other words, how much warmer was it in the most recent decade than the mid-century, 20th century average. And it's easy to say when the signal emerges from the noise, your eyes go right to it. And that happens to be right when Jim Hansen of NASA stood up in front of Congress in 1988 and said, global warming is here, and it's time to start doing something about it. That was 22 years ago. The models, by the way, have been very accurate. These are models, model ones done in, in recent years have tracked very precisely around the, uh, the black line, which is our observed temperatures. And uh, the range of model outcomes is the blue shaded scatter plot. But if you run enough models, eventually you start to see, yes, these are actually coming in very reliably. This is a NASA uh, chart. I get impatient about this uh, subject. I graduated from Dartmouth in 1976 and went to Washington to work. And in 1977, this is what the National Academy of Sciences said. If the decision is postponed until the impact has been felt, then the die will have already been cast. And that's where we are. We've postponed decisions for now more than 40 years. And so we're facing a much more difficult task than should have been necessary. And there are reasons for that. I didn't know back then that Exxon's chief scientist was appearing before its top management board in 1977 and saying that. I bet he got fired. <laughs> saying that the real reason we had to stop using fossil fuels is not because we're running out of oil. The Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. <laughs> and he said, mankind has a five to 10 year time window to address this problem, to understand it and address it. And Exxon understood it very well in our work in Inside Climate News that described through Exxon's own documents um, how much they knew at the time and how they behaved for their subsequent 20 or 30 years. Uh, I'm proud to say was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service, which is journalist's highest award. And a finalist means that you didn't win. Um, <laughs> but the winner, we were, sec we were second behind a, a brilliant team from the Associated Press who documented the existence of slave labor in the shrimp industry in the South Pacific and tracked the shrimp to the American dinner plate. And in the course of their work resulted in the freeing of thousands of slaves from bamboo cages where they were held in between their work shifts. So that's a pretty high bar. And because you all don't know me, I, I, I just want to say, I've been covering this issue for a long time. This is my byline at the top of the Sunday New York Times in 1998, um, pointing out that an industrial group had decided to go re recruit scientific skeptics um, in an attempt to help convince journalists, politicians, and the public that the risk of global warming is too uncertain to justify controls. And so that's a theme that we heard for decades, that the risks were too uncertain. And although that theme is beginning to uh, become long in the tooth, we still have to recognize the responsibility of the large industrial corporations for the policies that we're following in this country. Um, a hundred of the biggest global corporations have produced in their products 70% of the carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere today. And um, it's important to understand that as you hear the discussion of what the right policy should be.
Now again, I'm going to emphasize, and this is a little bit like a broken record, that what's needed is a radical transition and not merely a fine tuning of current trends. And this isn't a new bit of information. This document was the result of a worldwide scientific collaboration that was published in 2015 by the United Nations on the way to the Paris Agreement as a way of opening the door to a conversation about whether two degrees of warming was, a, was, was an adequate target or whether we really needed to go a little deeper, harder, faster, and they decided that we did. And again, pointing out that up to half the coral reefs may remain if we do this right. Half of them may remain, and that's the best case. We still face an emissions gap, and scientists, in this case from the UN Environment Program, are noting that there are dire consequences of inaction. And they even say things like climate investments will become a precondition for peace and stability. And will require unprecedented efforts to transform societies. It's not that it's impossible, it's that this kind of heavy lifting is unprecedented. And it's not that we can't do it, because this report says we can do it, but it requires things that like of which you haven't seen before. Meanwhile, back in Montpelier, we would like to pass the Global Warming Solutions Act. We would like to institute a 100% renewable energy policy. We should be modernizing our efficiency utilities. You know, those of you who read my posting on the listserv, no, I have been in, into my basement, um, know that we brought Vermont efficiency in to help guide us to what our solutions should be in our house. And we'd like to bring those efficiency utilities where Vermont shows such foresight um, along even further. And we would like to participate in a strong transportation and climate initiative and not uh, Instead of saying what we should not do, I'll say what we should do is we should be a good neighbor in our region to others who are trying to reduce their transportation um, emissions. There's Tim. <laughs> we just approved the Global Warming Solutions Act in the House. As you all know, that doesn't mean it's going to become law. You need to be in communication with your representatives in Montpelier. Uh, Tim is not the one who needs to be persuaded. I'm still welcome to hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> These issues enjoy overwhelming support from Vermonters. We don't always talk about it. And when I moved to Norwich, I was struck. I thought I knew what the people of this town felt, but I was struck that I wasn't hearing it every time I went to the select board. Or, and I just decided, well, I'm going to start standing up. And as nervous as it makes me to do that, um, I felt that it was important to make my voice heard. And I think it's important for you to make your voices heard. And I think it's important for me to hear your voices and other voices. You have to learn not just to speak about this, but to listen about this. This was the infamous day in July of 2017 when Roman and I came into possession of a house in, in Vermont and we went to look at it and we found the Turnpike Road was washed out. And so you do need to learn your lessons locally. This washout came as a result of a storm which dropped about two inches of rain. And we know, because there's a lot of data, that the most intense storms in the northeast of the United States today have about 70% more water in them than they did the year that I was born. And we understand why that is. Warmer atmosphere holds more water. When a storm drives up, it drops more rain. This is not the last time a road in Norwich is going to be washed out. And so we need to start behaving suitably. And by the way, the problems go far beyond Norwich. I used to live in the Philippines. This is what happens when an intense storm hits the Philippines. 
so that's the Haiyan typhoon, which came ashore to Category 5. It was one of several Category 5 storms to have hit the Philippines in recent years. The Philippines is certainly getting more of these top category or beyond category storms than they used to. And the Philippines is not the place where the global climate carbon footprint originated. <coughs> it's easy to point the finger at somebody else. You know, maybe China ought to solve this problem. China has a larger slice of annual emissions than the United States does, because China, with its billion people, turned some decades ago to following the development path that the United States had blazed. Over the years, we go from the Civil War when the United Kingdom had, mo had the cumulative largest amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere it came from the United Kingdom. By 1900, the United States, the gray bar, was in second place. By 1921, the year my father was born, the United States was in first place. And by 1988, when Jim Hansen said global warming has arrived, China was making its appearance on the scene as a red bar in the middle. And by 2018, China had climbed all the way up to number two as the, as the cumulative source. In other words, how much of the carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere came from China, and the United States had still about twice as much. So another way of putting it is that the warming that we're experiencing today and that has been locked in for the next 10 or 20 years is principally re the result of the rise of the industrial power of the United States and its reliance on fossil fuels. And so if the science says global net zero by mid-century, there is a moral case to be made for the rich countries to be in the lead of redressing the problem. So it's an urgent matter, and it's our problem. And that's my message. We're the ones who have to address it. And I, I really look forward to taking questions. Thank you. Yes. How much of your information gets to our government? <laughs> Anyone from the government here? <laughs> Most of our information comes from our government. Do they read it? Uh, the, the people who produce it are very well familiar with it. But as you know, we have an administration here that doesn't base its um, actions on science. I should have asked administration. Yeah. And so, yes, they read it because they're very aware of it. When the National Climate Assessment came out, the Trump, this was published by the Trump administration, 2017. So they had to decide what to do about the fact that they knew this report was coming out. But it was bulletproof because it had been through the National Academy of Sciences peer review. So they decided, well, we'll just bring it out, and then we'll just ignore it. Um, we do have tools at our disposal for forcing the hand of the government, but right now the most effective tools that are at our disposal are not to force the hand of the government in Washington. It's a defensive action in Washington. It's to force the hand of our government right next door. Thank you. Yes? Um, in a couple of your slides, you showed uh, removal of um, carbon. Uh, how was that done? Okay, so there are a couple of ways to do it, and, and there's one way that is the industrial way that's very energy intensive and that probably even requires the uh, burning of fossil fuels to do it, and that uh, it takes the approach of we'll continue to burn fossil fuels, but in the smokestack we'll grab the carbon dioxide back out, and then we'll pipe it somewhere, and we'll inject it into the soil, and deep underground in a basalt formation, it will solidify and it'll last forever. And as a matter of chemistry and physics and so on, that's doable, but there are many, many practical obstacles. Now, the other way that we know of to get carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and lock it up in the ground is to grow trees, essentially, or other plants. 
And uh, we all understand that in photosynthesis, the tree is gathering carbon dioxide and going through chemical processes and locking it up as wood. What's less familiar to people is that the tree is also in communication with the soil through its roots and is putting chemicals into the soil which signal chemically to minerals and enzymes, release your stuff that I need in order to grow, and I'll trade you my stuff that I don't need, my carbon dioxide, and, and we'll stick it in the soil. So a forest policy or an agricultural policy which has the effect of making the soil healthier is also a policy which will have the effect of removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And this happens to be, according to the scientists, the most effective way of doing it. And it's not only the most effective, it's profitable even without a carbon price. In other words, the farmer profits by making her soil more um, healthier. And so this is a form of stewardship that is promising, but you cannot solve the imbalance of the industrial weight of our emissions by putting it all on farmers in the soil because it would take up more land than you have and because we're so efficient. At, so uh, efficient may be not the right word, but we're so effective at burning fossil fuels and putting them in the air. And the, the laws of thermodynamics make it easier to get carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than they, it is to get it out of the atmosphere. Okay. Yes? Um, on January 9th, I, I was uh, in a, the, the January 9th, the sustainability group from Dartmouth presented the plan, kinship heating plan, and they showed a pie showing that 65% of heating coming from biomass. And at the same time, uh, the presenter was no decay. And she stated that 25, it will be current, with the current plan, which is biomass plan, will replace the fossil um, um, current uh, oil fossil, uh, and will be, and will emit 25 percent more carbon than the current uh, uh, the plant now. So. How we can, right now, all of us, talk about that in, in our backyard, that's the plans of the group. So what should we do as a community uh, to, uh, I mean, this is what my dilemma is, no one is involving. Yes. Right now it's happening in our backyard. Yes, it is. It's happening in our backyard, and we're discussing plans about how to change our own uh, town hall, Tracy Hall, to a, a cleaner system. Um, I'll just make a couple of comments about biomass. Um, uh, when you burn a tree, you emit carbon dioxide. I mean, combustion is emission of carbon dioxide in production of heat. And um, that tree contains carbon dioxide that was recently in the atmosphere and that the tree had absorbed from the atmosphere. And the tree also, during its growth cycle, had sequestered some carbon dioxide in the ground. And yet, it's not a perfect closed cycle in which you can say this is a renewable fuel and so it doesn't matter. Because the growth of a tree to replace the one that you burned will take place over 100 years. And the emission that you're making today is being made today. And so at the least, you have to account for that delay. And you also have to account very carefully for the life cycle analysis for the sustainability practices in the forest where the tree is being grown, for the air pollutions that are other than carbon dioxide, particular pollutions, and so on, for the other disruption of ecosystems that come from the logging activity, and so on. And so if you can come up with a solution that does not involve combustion, I would suggest that you're probably uh, better advised to use that other solution like solar power, geothermal, or some non-combustion method 
especially if you're taking account of the price of the pollution, because a ton of carbon dioxide emitted today imposes a price on a future generation that's not always accounted for. What can you do to bring this along? What stopped Dartmouth from moving right along with this was the fact that three alumni who um, are, have reached positions of great prestige at Woods Hole uh, Oceanographic Institute at the MIT Sustainable Energy Program, uh, a founder of the Natural Resources Defense Council, um, wrote to Dartmouth and said, we think that you need to think this through again. <laughs> The Sierra Club is engaging in the conversation. The, the energy committees need to engage in the conversation. And the fact that you were at a presentation on this on January 9th means that you're engaging in the conversation. And the solution, that, that because this is such a complicated question, I'm loath to write a prescription. But I will say that it should be based in science. It should be peer reviewed. It should be transparently um, produced. In other words, the community should be engaged in the production of any such plan and that it should recognize the long-term impacts of the activity. And there is a place for biomass because there's a place here for living life. <laughs> I mean, we're all biomass. Um, but it's probably a bad idea to think that you can solve the global warming problem with a simple and relatively painless solution that's good for one of your local dying industries. Yes? Uh, it strikes me that one of the most important events to occur affecting climate change is going to occur in November 2020. Could you say something about what you think is at stake and the selection for climate change? Well, clearly, um, the, uh, the United States' involvement in the Paris Agreement is at stake, for example, because President Trump made it his business um, at the behest of the fossil fuel industries to withdraw the U.S. from the Paris Agreement, which can't happen until right after the election. Um, and so then there's the question of shall our policies be based on science or shall it be based on a distortion of science? And after a lot of careful study, of the regulatory and uh, process in, in Washington, I can assert with confidence that the current administration is not basing its policies on sound science. Um, I'm no longer constrained because I'm no longer a journalist in, in stating what my preferences are in electoral politics. And, um, and so I'll go ahead and go out on a limb and say you should probably vote to get rid of Donald Trump. <laughs> there are many organizations that are geared toward doing that. They deserve your support. They need your support. And you'll find them all around you. Um, and uh, that's one reason that I decided to um, join the Upper Valley group of the Sierra Club, because they have a long-standing record and, and because I have confidence in their ability to help us all model through this. Yes. Jack, I just wanted to add uh, to your response to this about Dartmouth and this question about our national circumstance. And, and, and it's to add a criteria. I think you offered four or five criteria there, and that was excellent. I want to add another. We should expect leadership from Dartmouth College. And so it's not enough to simply say, as, as some are saying, in defense of this new heating plan, oh, it's going to be biomass, or there might be some defenses that it's going to be carbon neutral or something like that. What we need at Dartmouth College and what we need here in our town of Norwich is leadership. And that's why the proposal here in Norwich uh, for geothermal heating and, and other revisions in, in our buildings is so important. If Norwich isn't going to be a leader in Vermont, then, then who are we? And it's, if Dartmouth College is going to continue to be an Ivy League elite school, then who are they if they're considering uh, a, a, a power plant that will have the kind of criteria that you spoke to? And then it, it's the same, obviously, with the leadership of our nation. Yeah. 
Uh, thanks, uh, Jim, and, and um, you know, I, 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 although I only recently moved to Norwich, I've been familiar with Norwich a long time, and I planned for a long time to move here. And um, Norwich has been a leader um, in recent years through its energy committee, but Norwich has been a leader for a long time, I'd say, even since ever since Noel Perrin bought the first electric car that I ever read about and drove it around up here. So um, uh, you live in a community of leaders, and let's continue to play that role. Yes, sir. Um, I'm Jake McGraw, and I work for the Coal Regions Laboratory from 1956 to 86. That's 30 years. We were drilling in the Greenland ice sheet and also in the ice sheets in, uh, in Antarctica because we could tell past the temperature is caught in the air that is, that is caught into the center snow, which turns to ice, but it has pores in it with air in it. And we could tell from the, scientifically, how, what temperature it was when the snow came down. All right. Well, now, that was 60 years ago. We plotted the temperature of the Earth, and it's interesting, you probably don't know this, but maybe a couple of thousand years ago, the Earth started warming naturally. And it's actually because we've got a wobble in, the, in, in our axis. That's why we've had 10,000 years ago, we had 2,000 feet of ice above us right here. And that you should know that because the Earth will eventually go back into an ice age. And by the way, if you're a climber and you climb up the trails on a scutney, not a scutney, you will, if someone points it out to you, you will be able to see that the top of Mount Scutney was not covered by ice. The ice sheet stopped there and the scutney stuck out above it. So uh, that, that, that tells you how thick this was. That's 2,000 feet up. Well, those ice sheets are melting now. And the Antarctic ice sheets are melting faster because they lie on the ocean. So they're warm below and they're warm above. In the Arctic, there's, or at least in Greenland, there's ground, stone, the uh, ledge underneath. So the Greenland ice sheet is not melting as fast, but what it reminded me was of something you said right at the beginning of your, your presentation, that the, the temperature of the Earth is going up faster than we thought it would. That's the danger signal. The point is, and I, I've been studying science ever since, I worked in the science of engineering, but I was kind of a scientist. Um, but what's happening is growing faster than we're predicting. The point is, that's a very recent, only the last few years, that we have discovered it's going faster than we thought it would. Well, in my studies of atmospheric over ice and snow, of the atmosphere, changes all by itself, fast. It can go back and forth very rapidly. And what seems to me the urgency, that's your main, main point here, the urgency for us now and the human race is that the Earth is just about, we think, about to tip over. It, and it'll, it'll keep going faster and faster and faster, probably until we figure out how fast it's really going to go. We don't really know. All of these predictions of, of the early, early future, up to 2015 and so forth, um, they're probably not true anymore. It, it's going to go faster than we think. And just ask yourselves, don't we have more snow than we used to for every snowstorm? We have big storms, rainstorms. The, at our, our, we may be warming, but the events, atmospheric storms that we're getting are getting more and more severe. And I'll just point out to you, 
the, 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 the forest fires, brush fires in California, and, and in Australia now, half of Australia is burning. Well, as you pointed out, that's putting CO2 in the air. And also, down in, in, the, in Brazil, we have corporations that are trickling to the jungle. But the jungle is taking CO2 out of the air and putting oxygen in. What you didn't say is that when a tree is growing, even our tree right here, they take in CO2 and they get out oxygen. So yes, plant trees. Thank you. And I have to say, we're very fortunate here in Norwich to have many scientists. We have, we have really, uh, uh, Suds and Science across the street routinely draws sell out crowds. Uh, and we, we have neighbors like um, Ross, Virginia, the uh, Arctic program at Dartmouth. We have people like Gus Spath, who lives up the road, who was um, Jimmy Carter's environmental uh, advisor. And uh, the woods are full of scientists here. We all understand that there's been natural variability in the, in the world's ecosystems. The, in your ice cores, we're trapped not just records of temperature, but records of carbon dioxide concentration. And the carbon dioxide tra concentrations that you track spike at levels like we're seeing now, or even higher. We haven't seen levels like today's in a million years. And the changes have not occurred in the natural variability of, uh, of CO2 concentrations and temperatures at anything like the pace that they're occurring today. We did have thousands of feet of ice above us at one point. We also had thousands of feet of lake above um, Hanover at a, at a time when the ice had melted. But those variations took place not over five years, 10 years, but over thousands of years. And they were not caused by human activities because most of them occurred before humans walked the planet. Um, so today, with the problem that we face today, I hold that this problem is due to our activities and that to the extent that we're masking natural variabilities with our own human footprint, that that's a problem. Yes? Yes, sir. Um, let's see. Uh, my name is Steve Lippin Parker. And uh, I'm going to say uh, the previous comments really upset me. Um, Don't get upset. Well, We're having a conversation. Here's the, here's the reason why. Um, I have an undergraduate degree in nutrition science and nutrition systems, and my graduate work is in agriculture and geography. And I studied actually climatology 42 years ago at Syracuse. I first heard about climate change. I was shocked. Now, here's my point. Uh, actually, we did move from DC in 1990 as a result of Hansen's comments, because uh, I understood it. Here's my point. Uh, the average person does not have your background. Most people have no clue that they live on a planet. <laughs> so to me, uh, the whole school system is based on a very nice curriculum. Uh, if, if the economic system, which is basically a fossil fuel system, I call it oil economics. Okay, it's oil economics. 99% of the economy in the world is based on oil. And people, our lifestyle, our uh, level of, of uh, uh, you know, you know, well-being, whatever, is really based on fossil fuel. This is only 300 years old. So whether or not it's changed dramatically in the last 50 million years, <laughs> up and down, up and down, which it does, you can look at the charts. We're not talking about charts anymore. And most people have no clue. I mean, look at the, look at the Congress of the United States. They all, they all support the president, who actually has, a, has no clue, too. It's all about golf courses. That's his, that's his mentality of, of, uh, of the environment. <laughs> you know, what's my golf score? You know, are the greens you know, well, well groomed? That's it. Can I go get a beer at, at my Cape hole? That's the limit of his thinking, OK? But half the people in the country support those politicians. So you're at a, we're at a massive sort of, to me, um, uh, kind of like challenge 
to uh, really even have a conversation. And this is a very small select group, but but you know, in various parts of the country or the world, you know, really are even think this way. So so to me, you need to change the whole entire school curriculum that there really be an economic bubble. Okay, you know, for the last hundred hundred thousand years or hundred million uh, million years, humans didn't live like this. <laughs> this is all kind of a a dream, all from fossil fuel. Money so, talks. Thank you. And given the hour, we're going to turn this over to our panel discussion. I just want to thank you all for your patience. And, uh, thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Jeff. And thanks, everyone, for your uh, questions to Jeff. My name is John Langus. I'll be the moderator of the next section of the program here. Uh, I am here by virtue of my membership with the Climate Action Committee here at the North Congregational Church, where all are always welcome, whether in our service or uh, our Climate Change Action Group meetings. Um, I do happen to also have the pleasure of serving Norwich as a select board member, speaking of our government next door. Um, I'm actually joined here, uh, as it turns out, by two other members of the select board, Mary Layton here and John Pepper in the back. Um, so feel free to grab them if you have questions about what's going on in Norwich in particular um, after the discussion. And, uh, and then in addition to uh, Tim Brickland, one of our two uh, state reps, we also have two select board candidates joining us uh, today. Rob Gear sitting up here up front, is running for the select board, as is Doug Wilberding back in the back by the column there. So lots of folks to, to buttonhole afterwards to talk about local stuff if you're so inclined. But now we move on to our illustrious panel. So if the panelists want to come, um, you can see by the cards where you're supposed to sit and then turn your card around for the audience. And what we're talking about here on the panel is things that are happening in our various communities around here in the area regarding, uh, that, that relate to climate change and the, and the challenges of climate change. That mic. Yeah, let's make sure everyone's got their space at the table. So closest to me here on the end, we have Yolanda Baumgartner. Um, she's with Sustainable Hanover. Um, next to her is uh, Jack Spicer. He's from Hartford. Um, and, uh, he's the chair of their Ad Hoc Climate Advisory Committee. And it's also on the Resilient Han uh, Hartford group. Uh, Linda Gray from here in Norwich. She is the head of our Norwich Energy Committee. And next to her is Michael Keese, who comes to us from the Thetford Energy Committee. So I'm going to uh, start here on the end with you, Yolanda. If you guys want to each just give a brief little introduction of yourself, and uh, then we can get to it. Hi. Thank you for having me here. Um, I'm Yolanda Baumgartner. I am a longtime resident of Hanover. In fact, I was reminded of how long I've been here because I just took my kids. I just took my kids to the bus for Logan, and on the way we passed Krauss. And Eric reminisced about the time that uh, our first house we lived near Krauss. And he said, do you remember when we had to evacuate because of the chlorine gas release? Um, and we had to leave the house in the middle of the night and go to, he thought, Leverone Fieldhouse for the night. Sounds very dramatic. It's been so long, I did not remember. <laughs> uh, I am a member of Sustainable Hanover, which is a town committee. My first appointment was in 2011. And about five years ago, I became co-chair with Marjorie Rogalski. There's about 30 plus volunteers who work in various uh, projects for Sustainable Hanover. And our, what we call, we've now started to call our pillars um, is energy, <laughs> environment, and community. Um, we do have an energy subcommittee that works on the, the topics that we're going to be talking about today. Thanks, 
Hello everyone, thanks for being here. My name is Jack Spicer. I'm from the town of Hartford. I live in White River Junction. I, uh, I moved here in 2014. I moved to the Upper Valley in 2014 from Central Ohio, uh, the cornfields. Um, I came up here for law school, went to Vermont Law School, uh, where I earned a master's in environmental law and policy and a JD, um, and I've stuck around ever since. Um, I moved to the town of Hartford in 2017 and joined Resilient Hartford, uh, which is an organization uh, created by the select board. Uh, I'm now vice chair of that organization, and I also joined the Ad Hoc uh, Climate Advisory Committee, uh, which was created uh, for a few reasons that I'll get into a little later. Um, but uh, that's, that's, the, that's the gist of it. Hi, and um, I'm Linda Gray, and I'm currently chair of the Norwich Energy Committee, and I've been active on the committee since 2008 after um, serving 10 years on the school board, and our family moved to town in 1986. And I'm Mike Keese from Thetford. Um, a little bit of a history. I started becoming a visitor to Thetford back in 1987 when I met my wife, Erica Hoffman Keys, who grew up there. And um, so we uh, visited frequently as we lived all over the world. And then back in 2011, I thought about having some roots somewhere and said, well, the best place I've found that I want to put down roots is this, this region here. Um, the, uh, uh, there's some kind of fun culture and environment and, and opportunity here. So um, started doing that. And, and the first thing I did when I got to town said, how am I going to get connected? What do I know something about? I know a little bit about energy. So I joined our energy committee. Um, and last year became the chair, um, trying to help us transition from uh, the great leadership of our founding member, Bob Walker, to um, kind of greater partnership uh, across the region and, and with other institutions. Um, Right now, I'm working with Vital Communities. I see some of my colleagues here, and um, and we it, that organization is also focused on bringing people together across borders, um, across town borders, across state borders, to work on issues that are bigger than any one of us can tackle with our own resources, our own imagination. So it's great to be here as part of a panel, and you know, be thinking about how do we work collaboratively to to put pieces in place that allow us to make the changes we need to to take care of each other. I'm glad to be here with you. Thank you all. I speak pretty loudly, so you can hold on to the mic. Um, why don't you start, and we'll start with you, Mike, where the, uh, Mike, where the mic is. Um, why don't you tell us about it? We're coming into town meeting season. Tell us whether your town has anything climate related that's going to be on your ballot this year. And then, if not, um, what else are you working on in your town that's related to climate issues? Uh, we do have something on our ballot. Um, we are working on trying to uh, support a regional energy coordinator position. And um, I'll back up just a little bit from that to explain why. Uh, the, the, I'm a systems thinker, and, and um, so I, I tend to think what things need to be in place for us to work collaboratively together. Um, we tend to need an aspirational goal that we all understand. Um, you know, Tim's work to have a, a, a Climate Solutions Response Act, that's, that's per a perfect aspirational goal that we can put in statute at a state level. Um, we've also, in our Thetford Town Plan, we said, well, we want the, the climate emergency to be part of our thinking. It should be a central part of what we do in our planning for our town. So we're trying to get an aspirational goal at the town level. So you need an aspirational goal. We're working at that. Um, the, uh, you also need strategic leadership, right? So, um, so you need to have a, a select board and a school board and, and the other kind of local boards that, that make strategic decisions thinking about you know, what kind of strategies lead toward our aspiration. Um, then you need operational leadership, right? So um, operational leadership is things like heads of schools and town managers and, um, and, and those are the folks who, can, who, who are actually implementing the resources to carry out the plans. And then finally, you need the grassroots level action. And that's where things like energy committees um, and, and uh, climate action committees, sustainable handovers, those things come into place where you're at your, it's the individual level activity. So I think you need all four of those. And in Thetford, we're saying we have an aspirational statement that we put in our draft town plan. We'll be reviewing that this year. 
At the bottom end, the grassroots, we have a really active and effective energy committee that's helped individuals do things as homeowners and um, you know as towns, things like that. Um, we just started having a town manager form of government last year in, Han in Thetford, which is allowing us our select board to move towards strategy, and we have someone who can be an implementer. Um, but something we're missing is the kind of professional operation operational institution kind of leadership management of, um, of, of energy, for energy. And so we thought we need an energy coordinator. Um, and we can't afford one all by ourselves. So this idea of partnering with some other towns in the area arose and we said let's see if we can get enough people to understand how a professional uh, regional energy coordinator could support our town in, in implementing the changes we need to save money and energy and, and have our climate be in the right place for the climate we can live in. Um, so that's that's the background of why we, we think we need this professional role. And the um, and then what we did is we put an article on the ballot which says shell the town, raise the sum of, it's about $15,000 um, for a regional energy coordinator. And then we put together a little two pager um, to try to help people understand what the regional energy coordinator would do, why that's important to our town. So we start with the aspiration. Um, and then we just kind of laid out some of the things that the that the a regional energy coordinator could do for our town and other towns in partnership. Um, and and you know I won't get into a lot of the detail, but it's there's um, there's a lot of opportunity for us to actually reduce the amount of money that we spend. Um, I think uh, the energy coordinator in, in Hartford and Levin have both been very effective in actually reducing taxes um, for people and, and providing the services we need at the same time. Um, so our idea is that we can, if we have a professional framework across multiple towns for the cooperation that we've done as volunteers in the past, we can do even more. We can, we can expand our impact significantly. So that's what's on our ballot, and that's why. Um, uh, Norwich has uh, three energy related articles on the ballot. So one is our, um, our, our version of what Mike just talked about, and for Norwich it's a, it's a higher amount of money because we're a larger town. Um, the second one is one I would give John Langus credit for putting on, and it's to start a, uh, is it right to say, call it a reserve fund? A designated, designated fund. fund. A designated fund, and it's a, a modest amount to start with, $40,000, 45? 45, I think. Okay, um, so to have available for um, different uh, climate-related activities. They, they are not defined yet, this is just a vote to create the fund. Um, then the, the bigger thing is a proposal that would relate uh, to the town facilities energy proposal. So it relates to Tracy Hall, our town hall, it relates to the two garages for the fire station and for the Department of Public Works. The bulk of the money, it relates to Tracy Hall. Um, and the majority of the money devoted to Tracy Hall is actually going toward toward um, ventilation and cooling systems, um, but the other, the most innovative part of the proposal is to switch Tracy Hall away from fossil fuel to a lease, so it would be via ground source uh, heat pump with geothermal wells. And I want to mention that the, the reason that it's gone that direction is in fact because of our vote last year at town meeting. and. Have, and, the, and there was a, a very strong vote. It was 80% in favor of a directive to, to make town operations reduce the use of fossil fuels beginning at a rate of no less than 5% per year starting in 2019-20 fiscal year and continuing until they are eliminated. So given that direction from the town, when the energy began, energy committee began working with an energy performance contractor, um, we were gave them the directions to say, hey, you know, give us advice, recommendations on how to move away from fossil fuels. So that's that's how this proposal developed. So, so vote for that. <laughs> and there's actually, if this doesn't uh, satisfy you for the day, following this, there's Thank another you. session uh, out in the sanctuary where we will be hosting the. Norwich Energy Committee 
who will be doing an information and question and answer session for Norwich about that uh, proposal to renovate Tracy Hall and some other some other town facilities. So as you might have guessed, the town of Hartford also has something uh, on the ballot for March. Um, I'll start with that, the language of that, that warrant article and then I'll go into a brief history of, of how we came about uh, forming it. So the, ballot, uh, the warrant article says, shall the development, operation, and maintenance of the town of Hartford's municipal infrastructure and equipment be required to achieve carbon neutrality by 2027? So this, this is a pretty aggressive goal. Um, the town of Hartford, like M Mike mentioned, does have an energy coordinator um, who is a m member of, of this committee uh, that came up with this language. Um, we also have folks from the select board, from the school board, and uh, from the town planning office uh, that, that helped form this language. Um, we, were, we were formed by the select board uh, and given really two tasks. The first task was to come up with uh, language to declare a climate emergency. Uh, the select board had noted uh, the thousands of communities that had declared a climate emergency and said, you know what, we want to be a part of that, that, uh, those communities that have done so. Um, so our, we did the first task, uh, initially uh, met in September, uh, had language uh, for a declaration uh, in November, and then in December, both the school board and the select board passed uh, the resolution. The second task was to come up with a war article that uh, attempts to achieve the goals set in the emergency declaration. Um, and that's, that's really how we got here with this language. Uh, we thought, we have, we have a lot of infrastructure and buildings in the town. We have control over that infrastructure and that equipment. Um, and if we want to uh, achieve anything in the town of Hartford, we need to lead by example. Um, and, th and that's really, that's how we came up with this goal. Uh, we said the development, operation, and maintenance are really the three major areas uh, that we have control over, our infrastructure and our equipment. Um, we said, let's, uh, let's try to achieve carbon neutrality by 2027. Um, and th yeah, so that's, that's what's on the ballot for March 3rd. Um, at this point, uh, it's, it's up for a vote. <coughs> This sounds like really exciting <laughs> proposals. <laughs> um, the Hanover Town meeting is in May, so we are actually still um, not at the deadline for uh, Warren articles, so we're still working on things. Um, I think our, our big um, town meeting event was in 2017, when um, the town, the voters, decided we should um, transition from fossil fuels to 100% renewables in this program that was called Ready for 100. Um, and <coughs> within that is a statement that the town operations would be a model that they would um, get, be as far ahead of the crowd as necessary to set the example. Um, so since then we've had uh, minor warrants, uh, kind of setting, giving us tools. We had one about uh, per, uh, allowing um, solar, ground mount solar systems. Um, we've had to, we put in the exemption for uh, property taxes for solar systems. Um, and it's been those sorts of things. And this year, um, one zoning uh, change that I know that's going to be proposed is to permit um, solar on buildings that are that will exceed the building height limit. So if there's an existing building that's been um, built at the maximum, <coughs> they will still be able to put solar on top. So we've been tweaking <coughs> things. Um, our next big thing is actually going to be um, next the next town meeting. Uh, because the state legislature and then miraculously our go governor actually signed a, an energy law in, uh, into effect, which is for community, ag uh, community choice aggregation. So this will allow um, towns and counties to uh, procure and uh, purchase electricity on behalf of uh, their businesses and residents. So that just went into effect in October, and um, it's it's a brand new animal. We're 
We're not even sure that the legislatures knew exactly what it should be. Um, about eight or 10 towns in New Hampshire have already expressed an interest in this and we're working together to figure out how to proceed. So I think it's gonna take a while, but if you live in Hanover, watch next year, because I think it's really going to be a game changer. Uh, small businesses and um, residents make up 30, about 35% of all the um, electri uh, electricity con consumed in Hanover. Um, over, we've been tracking this, uh, the data from Liberty Utilities since 2013. And the one exciting thing is actually the consumption is going down. Um, we just got the 2019 numbers and we're almost 11% under what it was uh, in 2013. That's really exciting, and that's um, Barb Calloway there, I see. Um, she is heading our Weather Eyes campaign, which is going to really help uh, bring those numbers down. Um, and I'll just give a shout out, because I know she's doing two drop-in sessions. So people here from Hanover have not yet signed up for Weather Eyes and would like to. There's one uh, Thursday, noon to 12, at Umblebee. And um, the following Wednesday um, evening, 5.30 to 7.30 at Still North. Great. Thank you, Ilana. John, um, can I ask a question? Sure. And, and actually, I, I want to, it's to Tim to ask the, uh, the what is it, com the community choice aggregation, is that a utility kind of thing that is possible in New Hampshire and not in Vermont? I don't know. Oh, oh, okay. It's currently not available in Vermont. That, okay. Yeah, there are okay. several states that have enacted uh, community choice aggregation rules. Um, New Hampshire is maybe the most recent. Okay, yeah, right. It's an I interesting think, um, uh, way to approach the. Pre previous to New Hampshire, there were, um, I think, seven or eight other states. Mm -hmm. And most of them, th they have enacted them to actually just uh, for cheaper energy. They were trying to bring the cost down. Uh, California is the model where they have really used it to introduce higher levels of renewables into the mix. And also resiliency, I think. Exactly. I think it is. Okay. Um, there's a famous, uh, famous quotation about politics that fans of sausage and government should watch neither being made. <laughs> Having said that, um, so, you know, I consider government to be a team sport. Um, thinking about the different stuff that you all have going and that you're working on, what are the stops along the way as you develop these initiatives where other folks can get involved with that? Um, and that probably differs from, from town to town a little bit. Right. Um, I think um, Hanover is a little bit unique in that um, we have such a mix of energy users. So we have Dartmouth College, which uses more than half of our, our total energy. Um, and then we have everyday people like myself and, and all of you. So we've um, divided uh, users into what we call sectors, and we approach them differently. So we are, we have um, worked with, uh, definitely, uh, we have uh, ongoing meetings with Dartmouth, but um, all the other uh, large users like um, Krell and, and Kendall, um, we approach them differently. And then we uh, also try to remember uh, the small users and find ways to help them access um, uh, green energy because we know they want it. I mean, people are, are really, really um, into this. So we, we do emails, we have these great neighborhood gatherings, um, and we're always um, eager to hear more technique. So. I'm going to be listening. Do <laughs> you feel like you're preaching to the choir on your neighborhood gatherings? Um, a little bit, and so that's why, um, for example, at our annual forum coming up, we are looking for new voices. And so we're doing something where uh, we've just put the call out for uh, groups to submit applications to do a five minute <coughs> pitch. So we're calling it a pitch. Um, and we have just started to work with high, high school students. Um, we're trying to get out there in different ways. And 
let them know that we want to listen to hear from them. Can I make a comment, please? Mm -hmm. uh, one, one of the wonderful things of Yolanda and Barbara, um, we're talking about the neighborhoods, which consume perhaps the smallest amount, but the, the town, and Barbara in particular, has really worked aggressively to get the neighborhoods thinking about things. And if I'm, I might have the wrong uh, number, but I believe because of the work on trying to do weatherization, there were 59 uh, homes that have signed up through uh, New Hampshire saves to get energy audits and um, it, and that also from that from the electric company but we reimburse half of what you do up to four thousand dollars. So even down at the lowest level I'm really happy with how Hanover is really making things So I'm, I'm not a member of the select board. I'm not an elected official for Hartford. I'm actually just an ordinary uh, citizen. I just live in Hartford. Um, one of the great things about Hartford and, and these communities is that we have, we have organizations that are created by the select board that are there for anybody to join. Um, and that's what, that's what I've done. Um, and it just so happens that the select board and the school board actually listen to these committees. Um, I, I remember when I was an undergrad and I, I was an activist, we would try to get something passed, we would get it all the way up to the top, and then they'd send it down to a committee. And we'd call it death by committee. <laughs> That's not the case here. The select board really listens to what we have to say. Um, they join in on our, on our meetings, um, and in many cases, they're actually members or liaisons to these committees. Um, that's, that's really the best avenue at Hartford, in my opinion, to get involved. Um, where there are constantly openings. All of the meetings are uh, subject to the o open meetings laws. Uh, you can go and join and your voice will be heard if you, if you come to a meeting. Um, and they're happening literally every day of the week. Um, so there's Resilient Hartford, which does uh, more of a climate adaptation, um, but there's also the Energy Committee. The Ad Hoc Climate Advisory Committee is, uh, there's a possibility of it becoming a standing committee. Um, right now it's ad hoc, we had a few tasks. Uh, that we're about to achieve. Um, but then after that, it'll be a committee that'll be reformed um, and open for, for people to uh, apply to, to join. Um, other than that, there, there's town meeting day. There are informational nights uh, for folks to come and uh, insert their opinion uh, on, on things that have been proposed. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really the best way, in my opinion, to get involved in the town of Hartford is to join a committee, come to a couple meetings, um, if you don't want to, if you're not sure about joining, see what it's all about. Uh, so. Um, so to answer, the question is how can people get involved, basically, mm -hmm. right? So I'll talk a little about the Energy Committee. So I would say that I feel that, that the Energy Committee has played probably the largest role in town in terms of energy or climate issues. and. We meet monthly, and official membership is by is being appointed by the select board. But it's very easy to, to just come and volunteer with us. So that's one thing. The other thing, though, that I also want to add is that I feel like I've noticed over the last year or so that there, and it's been a delight for me because I've noticed that there are people who are not on the energy committee who are getting active and trying to take action on energy and climate issues. So like the, like the group here at the Congregational Church, I've had, we've had contacts from um, members of the Lions Club. So that to me is um, extremely encouraging because that means more and more people are interested in trying to take action on that. So I would say that almost any any organization that you're involved in, that's an avenue for doing something. Um, and so just just go ahead and do it. <laughs> yeah, what did you just say? <laughs> um, I, well, I, you know, the, the committees, the, Looking backward, my experience in Bedford, um, 
the, the Theft Free Energy Committee is very open to participation. We have some official members that are appointed. We have some friends of, Peter McCoster's <laughs> back there in the corner, who's very active, um, but there's not an official member of the committee. Um, and our select board is very open, and our conservation commission, our planning boards, uh, are really open to participation by anybody and welcome that and, and you know, try to make it public. But, that said, um, it's a rare intersection of time, energy, money, and passion to get you to be part of a committee. Um, I'm really impressed that there's this many people in the room. You know, it's, there's, but consider this number compared with the populations of the four towns alone mm. that we represent, right? So, um, so if the intersection of time, energy, passion and, and, and are rare, then how do you connect with people who don't have lots of uh, discretionary whatever they need to be a full-time participant? And that's where uh, I think our energy committee is, and not just ours, but and, and lots of other groups have tried to reach out to people where they are. And, um, and so, you know, our Theft Free Energy Committee, we said we really want to try to help people weatherize who, who aren't going to be able to participate in the weatherize program on their own. Um, and so we started doing things with our food shelf and, and trying to reach partner war with capstone and cover um, to, to reach folks and help them walk through processes that we can't do alone or they couldn't do alone, but with some help they might be able to. Um, this is one example of, of reaching out to folks. The, um, there's, uh, you know, at Thetford Academy, there's a climate action club that got started. And, and so we try to reach out to them and say, hey, how could we do something? Here's a town committee, here's this club. How can we cross over a little bit and, and see if we can do some complimentary things? Um, the, our energy committee is starting to talk more with uh, the Thetford School Board and the TA Board to say, could we somehow work a little more collaboratively with you? Um, so those are trying to reach out to existing structures, existing things, and, and just come back to what you said, Linda, we're all connected in some way, right? And so, so use whatever connection you have to say, all right, among us, how can we, what, what combined a little bit of time, passion, energy, money, could we put towards something? And then do a little looking around and find out who's got something you can latch onto and, and break that down from a full-time job into uh, something you could do in a weekend. You know, make, make little tasks. That's, I think that's the main thing, is reach out to committees and say, what one thing could I do on a, on a voluntary basis for an hour or something mm -hmm. like that? And, and it's up to the committees to try to create those opportunities too. Can I want to grab, grab the mic back and say one more thing, which is one of your last comments made me think about, you know, the idea behind these climate scarves that you're seeing is, is not just to show them, but to have them a spark a conversation that you can have with people about the climate crisis and take an action on it. And frankly, you don't need a scarf to do that. So I would say one of the most important things, if, if you don't have a ready group that you're involved in that m maybe has a building that you could try to get them to take action on, but the thing about it is to talk to other people about the fact that you've learned this stuff from the slide presentation that Jack made, talk to people and get them thinking about it and try to translate into like things that you could do yourself, but also policy things that you could support. So we're gonna open up to um, questions and answers, but before we do that, one more, one more question here. People who are concerned about climate emergency, some of those voices are saying that this year, the federal election is overwhelmingly important. Um, the, um, not just the presidential election, but the control of Congress is uh, a make or break election for, in particular, the climate issue, but God knows many others. Um, some of those people say, focus every bit of energy you have on the federal election. So what do we say as local leaders um, to, to those folks that are rightly concerned um, about the need to, while focusing on that, saving a little bit of activity for our own local initiatives? <laughs> or not. <laughs> I would preface this as just completely personal opinion and, and my own life experience that um, I accomplish much more by listening to people learning what they care about, um, hearing their story, and then, and, and 
you know, often mine, but if I just share mine. And then with that exchange of stories, we can make a future story together. And that, that's harder to do the farther away you are. Um, so it's not impossible to do at a national level. It's probably important to try. Um, but in my own life, I've been most effective with my neighbors, um, with people that I can encounter with, that I can listen to face to face. And, and that making a shared story together um, is how we create the future that we, that's good for all of us. So be active where you can, wherever you can engage. To, to, to listen to somebody else and hear their story and then see if you can make a great story together. Um, my answer to your question is that, that we can do both. You know, that's it, that's it. What you can do on a local or state level provides a model for broader action as well. So, so my answer is do both. I, I certainly agree with that. Um, well, one thing I'd like to add though is when our administration pulled out of the, the climate accord. Um, it, it, I was in law school, at an environmental law school, and it was a, it was a moment uh, that made me take a step back and think about, well, who, who are the leaders on these issues? Who, who's gonna be the leader on climate change issues? And looking at this room, I think, I think we are the leaders. I think that local initiatives, um, I, local initiatives, uh, with neighbors, um, they're, they're the key. They're the things that will last because when our local communities invest in something, they carry it through. On the federal level, we might, we might invest in something and then four years later, everything will be reversed. The rug will be pulled out from under our feet. There's always a chance of that and we've seen it happen. Here, when we invest, we carry it through and I think that that's what's important. That's the lesson is that the more local you get, the more lasting impact you will have. Well, um, I guess I'm an optimist and a pragmatist, and often that means uh, just using what tools you have, and that's working on the local level. But I do know that what happens at the state and the federal level just could make such a huge difference. Um, so that example that I gave about a community choice aggregation, um, back in 2015, we in Hanover did a uh, program, it was a group by essentially of Green Power. And um, we rolled it out to the residents so that they could choose the supplier that we are partnering with and they could then receive 100% uh, certified green electricity. Um, that was a great program, it was really popular. The first year we had an enrollment of um, 350, which was 300 more than the industry experts were telling us we would get. Um, and two years later though, um, the company we were working with, which was a regional uh, company, got bought out by a Houston oil firm who didn't care about green certification, thought they didn't want to meet our standards, so we folded the program. Um, and people are still asking me, are you going guys going to do it again? Um, but we don't have to because the state law is going to give us a much more powerful way to achieve the same thing. This community choice aggregation means that when Hanover has a plan, everyone will be in the plan unless you choose to opt out. So instead of talking about 350 um, enrollees, we're talking about thousands and our ability to make a change, um, bring that price down, uh, get bargain for uh, renewable energy would just be that much more powerful. So I, I don't think you can ignore the bigger picture, um, but you know we all have just so much time. Thank you. Okay, so we'll open up to a few questions. They can be directed at a specific panelist or to the group. Um, if you're afraid of not being heard, feel free to walk up here and use the mic. It's it's a wired mic, not wireless, so we can't pass it around. But uh, Sugar. I just wanted to comment. I don't know how many of you all received requests in the mail from people that are running for the Senate that are not in Vermont, that live in other states. There's an opportunity to give some money to them if you feel like you want to. 
you can also go to Maine and knock on doors. <laughs> <laughs> or you can go to Kentucky, which is what I'm going to do this summer, wow. and try to ditch Mitch. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so uh, our goal is to be 100% uh, green electricity by 2030 and the rest of it by 2050. And so we have been very targeted uh, on electricity um, and um, reducing demand, basically. Um, we have talked about heavy equipment and the issue that um, the, the equipment is just not there. So um, we have put that aside. But your idea of offsets is very good. So we've also discussed some of the, um, the harder um, parts to, to our puzzle, uh, the equipment making it net zero. Um, by 2027 and uh, endorse the idea of offset offsets. Um, I think in the short term, they will be necessary. Um, there's a market for them now. Um, so not just local projects. We do have a town forest. Um, there, are, there are local initiatives that could be had. But there's also this market where we can invest in uh, carbon sequestration measures uh, globally. Uh, and in a lot of ways, those, those markets will make sense in the short term. What about the long term? The long term, well, the goal is that when the state becomes uh, carbon neutral and the nation becomes carbon neutral, all of these, these issues will be a lot uh, easier to achieve. There will be technology that will have developed um, by 2027, by 2050, that will make, make it easier for us to, go to achieve our carbon neutrality goals. Um, of course, we can't predict what they will be. But I would hope that those things that are necessary for us to uh, carry on a certain way of life, uh, use our roads, um, will be a priority uh, for the markets, uh, for, the, for the folks that develop that, uh, those, uh, that equipment. Who's next? can't believe all of your questions have been answered just today. Ed. I, I just want to put a shout out for uh, uh, some boots on the ground work that Color's doing in our uh, Upper Valley community and, and all of your towns. Uh, uh, when we talk about today making a, a difference in the, the amount of fossil fuel we're using, uh, their weatherization projects are, are just fantastic and they're serving a population uh, um, of people that might not otherwise be able to afford it right up to, to you know, anybody else covering in our group. Thanks, Ed. So we're, uh, sorry, yeah? Um, just comment, when we use the language in terms of renewable, mm -hmm. renewable doesn't mean necessarily it's good for the planet. The planet doesn't care if the carbon mountain is gone, if it's, you know, fossil fuel or anything. We need to actually, when the town officials told me, I think maybe we need specifically to use the technology. Technology already exists. Trees are perfect technology. Mother Nature already gave us technology. We don't need to go and cut the trees. We let them do the job. <coughs> My question is, if we don't change the language, how we communicate to the public, <coughs> renewables could be trees. They are renewable, theoretically. You know? But it takes a long period for us to grow them. And to, so maybe we start using, instead of renewable, maybe we should start using carbon-free. Or you know, the language is very powerful. <coughs> So I, I think we are tired as a young generation, we don't have any future. So we depend on how you communicate to people, how you educate the people. This gentleman raised a very good question. Maybe we have to start changing the school system, how to communicate to the children as well. And that's a very, very cool point I wanted to make. 
have any of you all in your in your work changed your language as you've as you've evolved yourselves? Um, it, not on this topic, but a language change I've made is to not say climate change, but climate crisis. Right. Yeah. Uh, we've had a lot of debate about language. Uh, landing on the ad hoc <laughs> climate advisory committee um, made me think about the use of the word global warming, which I was uh, quite surprised. Uh, Tim, that's the that's the title of, of the, <laughs> or used in the title of the most recent uh, bill that passed the House. Um, but yes, yeah, so a lot of the language is important, but I, I think the conversations that they spark are even more important. It's it's about getting people to to the talking table, and then having those deep conversations. I think that's that's really where the power is. Uh, so it's it's the language is to not turn people away um, and to attract them, but really the conversations uh, what that you have are what's what's the most powerful in my opinion. I'm um, just get, get getting back to um, the use of the word renewable. I totally get uh, what you're saying. We do use a technical definition of what we regard as renewable, and that is by the EPA green power standards. So, for example, if you're thinking of biomass, there is a very specific, convoluted, long description of what qualifies, and, and it's not just wood in general. And, and same with um, hydropower. Mm -hmm. I think there is a great resource. Yale University has a great um, uh, group within the university called the Center for uh, Climate Communications. Um, and they, they spend a lot of time thinking about this, about studying it, what words convey most powerfully the ideas that we try to do. Um, I am going to encourage you to stick around Talk with these guys on anything you need. I am out of time here so that we can get ready for the next one. Last point, 30 seconds. This is an issue that's really daunting for folks. It's scary. It can make you really sad, actually. Um, what's something in the last year you can point to that's been good news on the climate front that you've looked at, that's inspired you, that's helped you to get out and, and continue the fight? Um, for me, it was the, the number of people who turned out in September for our climate strike. That was the human chain going across the Ledger Bridge. That was about 700 people. And the organization of that didn't start till perhaps 10 days in advance. And um, so that made, <laughs> that gave me some, some hope of success. Just again, it's another example of how people who aren't on the Energy Committee care enough to do something about it. Um, I think uh, my being here is an example of that. I just find there are so many connections happening. This year, for the first time, a few uh, weeks or months ago, we were on a panel at the high school. Um, and uh, we have so many uh, people approaching the Energy Committee. We a actually are starting to worry a little bit about how we're going to handle meetings with giant crowds. Um, people are just coming forward with emails, um, asking specific questions, or what can I do? I want to do something. So I just think the climate is wonderful. Um, just We just need uh, Washington and Concord to get out of the way. <coughs> I guess something I feel is uh, that I've been observing I increasingly over the past year is the um, the willingness to take responsibility and to make personal change, behavioral change based on that. And it, you know, we talk about reducing um, emissions by 15 or 45 percent. And well, what's you know how do, how do we personally emit? You know, I, I drove my car here. Um, if I ride with somebody, that's a 50 percent reduction. You know, I mean, it's the it's things like um, that, that, that we, they're choices we can make in our everyday life, and people seem to be increasingly open to those choices. Um, I'm doing many more meetings on my laptop than, than trying to go there. Um, I'm trying to, you know, it's, it's the small things. It's turn down the thermostat. Jimmy Carter said, turn a light out, you know, back in 76. It still works. Um, and people are, are saying, oh, yeah, um, I have some responsibility. What can I do? And, and are sort of open to, that I can make small changes in my life that aren't huge things, but they, they make a reduction right now.
That's helpful. Maybe it's just uh, part of this area, but one thing that struck me over the last year is we're no longer debating whether climate change exists, how much uh, humans are, are contributing to global warming. We're talking about what can we do and does it make sense for us? And I think that those conversations have revealed in many cases, the climate measures, climate mitigation measures make sense for us economically. They make sense for us socially. They really bring us together. And I think that that realization is, is really, uh, of the, the change in conversation that has really just inspired me over the last year. All right, can I have a round of applause for our panel?